Hey everybody, Connor Wander here with the Straight From The Scientist podcast. Lots happening in our scientific lives over the past few months, so I apologize not updating you about that because first, we still have a few more episodes from my conference trips to San Diego. Based on your feedback, we're going to be rolling these out in a shorter episode format, all individually instead of grouped up together in common themes. So let us know what you think about the new format. We're always trying to make the experience better for you. This particular episode is with Dr. Elizabeth Head. It was recorded at the AD Fast Track conference put on by Bright Focus in San Diego again. Thank you to Martha and Rachel for helping me set that up. Dr. Elizabeth Head is from the University of Kentucky, and she's studying the link between Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. So there are a lot of commonalities between the two disorders, and studying each one can help us learn about the other because they may have a very similar mechanism. It's all centered around aggregation and deposition of Emily Beta. Now, some uh, things in the news, uh, unfortunate news actually, as of just a few days ago, aducanumab, which was Biogen's anti-amyloid antibody, actually failed in clinical trials or it's being canceled. So we're, very, we're all very sorry to hear that. It, it, unfortunately, it does kind of represent a nail in the coffin for the amyloid hypothesis in that you can't really target amyloid as a therapy. Um, so the extra amyloid that's coming up in Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome, as we'll hear a little more about later in this podcast from Dr. Head, may not be a, a good therapeutic target. But it's very important to note that just because we can't get rid of amyloid doesn't mean we can't block the downstream effects of amyloid protein accumulating. And that's where I think Down syndrome patients and Alzheimer's disease patients can really kind of learn from each other through the studies that are going on. It's a great podcast. Um, I learned a ton while talking to Dr. Head, and I wish you could have seen her presentation. Before I turn it over to Dr. Head, I want to make one more quick announcement. We have officially launched the Straight From a Scientist Network, the SFS Network. You can find that at straightfromascientist.com forward slash SFS Network. This is basically just a grouping of scientists, blogs, other podcasts, and just general tools and resources for people who are scientists or science interested, wanting to learn more about the field. Maybe you're a student trying to find that perfect fit for a research interest. You don't even know where to start. So head on over to the SFS Network. We have a great grouping of scientists who we've worked with or plan to work with in the future. And if you're interested in joining, please email us at straightfromascientist at gmail.com with a bio picture, as you see in the thumbnails, something like that and a, a little preview for whatever you're working on, what it is that you're studying. And of course, any social media links or places you want to forward people. And with that, give it over to the episode. Enjoy, everyone. Welcome, everyone. I have with me Dr. Elizabeth Head from University of Kentucky. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. So you are a co-PI on a brand new Bright Focus Alzheimer's Disease Research Grant, um, and you want to create an, an international brain bank for Down syndrome research. That's right. And that was actually led by Lata Granholm, and we have another co-PI is Elliot Mufson. So it's a great, uh, great team of people. Excellent. So what's the connection between Alzheimer's and Down syndrome? We don't normally think of them in the same space. Yeah. So it, uh, people with Down syndrome, most people, 95% of people, have a full extra copy of chromosome 21. And on that chromosome is the gene for the amyloid precursor protein. So that means the people with Down syndrome are making too much beta amyloid right from birth. It turns out when you follow folks with Down syndrome as they get older, by the time they're 40, they have full-blown Alzheimer's disease neuropathology in their brains. But what's interesting is they may not show signs of dementia until about another 10 years later. That's kind of similar to the timeline of an Alzheimer's disease patient, right? where we see amyloid deposition um, preceding by a matter of decades, and then the symptoms present, typically with tau tangles. So do Down syndrome patients also get tau tangles? They do, and I think the timelines are kind of squeezed in Down syndrome, so everything happens on a much faster scale. Right. But yes, indeed. So usually by the age of 30, they have full-blown beta amyloid plaques, and then by the time they're 40, they show the tangles as well. So is this the first research effort to kind of coordinate research into both of these fields? <laughs> Thankfully not. Uh, this kind of research has been going on for at least 30 or 40 years, I would say. 
Uh, some of the original work was by Henry Visnaski, who pointed out the link between the two disease states. Um, so we're just kind of all coming together now and really accelerating the research program. That's, that's excellent. So what are you hoping to accomplish by linking the two fields together? Um, what, what's like the ultimate mission? Well, as everybody, the ultimate mission is to try to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease or mm -hmm. more importantly, find a way to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And in people with Down syndrome, um, since Alzheimer's disease is so age dependent, we have a really good shot of finding a way to prevent the disease in, these, in these, uh, this cohort. And we hope by extension, once we identify interventions that work for people with Down syndrome, we could take that to everybody. And you think they're an excellent kind of microcosm into accelerated uh, AD, right? Right. And these biomarkers that you're going to look for in both of uh, AD patients and Down syndrome patients, um, are there any that are kind of exclusive to Down syndrome patients or any special cognitive tests that you'll run? Yeah, as you note, I mean, people with Down syndrome do have intellectual disability. So coming up with neuropsychological tests that are sensitive to dementia in this cohort can be a bit of a challenge. But there's some of the best minds working on this around the world, and we are working on a consensus to find a number of tests that we can use and follow people over time to see when they might convert to dementia. So they're in some ways similar to what we use in the, the general AD population, but some are very specialized, of course, taking into account some of their more limited vocabulary, for example. Have you worked with these patients directly? We do. We have a cohort running at the University of Kentucky. Uh, so we have people who are 25 years and older, who uh, about 76 of these people, who come and visit us every year. They're wonderful volunteers. And we've been following some of our people for over almost nine years now. It's very cool. I'm sure you get to know them really well. And it's They're lovely. Great They're lovely. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned during your talk that uh, you say virtually all uh, people with Down syndrome will get amyloid beta accumulation. You said virtually because you still <laughs> suspect that maybe it's out there, but you haven't seen it yet. Um, but then there was a small portion of the population that as they get older, they still remain free of Alzheimer's disease symptoms. Can you speak a little on that? Yeah, so that's really exciting. Um, when you look at a bunch of different cohort studies around the world and you look to see who has developed signs of dementia, uh, in people with Down syndrome with age, we're seeing people creeping up into their 70s without showing clinical changes. And that maybe represents 15 to 20 percent of people now. And we're starting to think that maybe some of the lifestyle changes that we've implemented for people with Down syndrome to improve quality of life and or being able to control some of the risk factors has led to also an improvement in this cohort. So Maybe over time, as the years go by, we're going to see that margin get bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And when we identify these people, we can compare them to people with Down syndrome who do develop dementia mm -hmm. and see what's different. See what those people might be doing right in their exactly. lives. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very cool um, form of study. Absolutely. So this all, um, Down syndrome, the overexpression of APP leading to more amyloid beta, um, it seems kind of like a model of familial or early onset AD that we often see in mice. So does studying people who are genetically at increased risk for AD um, also benefit the people who are uh, sporadic AD or um, those people who aren't really reflected either in the mouse models? That's a really good conceptual question to kind of think about. Uh, in many respects, despite the fact that we're dealing with essentially a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease, how they look as they get older and how the pathology develop look develops looks virtually identical to what we see in sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So we're not dealing with a mutation system. Right. We're dealing with an overexpression system. So I think in that respect, it overlaps a lot more with sporadic. But there are some unique features to Down syndrome um, that seem to maybe overlap a little bit more with familial Alzheimer's disease. So then maybe people with Down syndrome can uniquely tell us about both types of Alzheimer's. Yeah, it's such an interesting concept. And I haven't it's hard to believe I haven't heard about it before. <laughs> um, what got you interested in these studies, and how long have you, and uh, how long have you been going? So I, I originally became interested in this when I was at the University of California at Irvine, and I met a pediatric neurologist by the name of Ira Lott. And Ira has been interested in this question for many, many years. I think he's he might admit to thirty plus years at this point. And it was his passion for the whole uh, research and his caring for these people and their families 
that really got me passionate about the question as well. And when you look at it now, a lot of people or almost all people with Down syndrome are excluded from clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. So they're kind of an underserved group of people that deserve our attention as well. Uh, and, and because of Ira, uh, I started working on this in the late 90s. So if we do a little bit of math. I'm just over 20 years now working on this problem. And you've gotten pretty far, I think, by the looks of it. Um, how can people get involved? Uh, patients, caregivers, is there any way for people to really get um, working in? Yeah, so there's multiple areas. Uh, first is we really encourage families to be engaged in, in research. We ask for people with Down syndrome to, for, uh, to self-advocate for research. So we reach out a lot to Down syndrome as, uh, as associations. But more importantly, and especially for workshops like what we're doing here for Bright Focus Fast Track, is getting more and more junior investigators engaged because the more people we have working on this, the better our chances are of coming up with something really innovative that's going to help these people as they get older. Is this your first time at uh, Bright Focus? It Fast is. Track? Yeah. It is. I've heard about it, but this is my first time here. Well, I'm glad you can make it. As <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm, I'm glad I, I could make it as well. So I have... Um, one kind of mechanistic question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I caught in the reading a uh, while back, DYRK1 is um, overexpressed in Down syndrome, mm -hmm. also possibly has some links to Alzheimer's disease and tau phosphorylation, which right. is like my neck of the woods. Uh -huh. um, have you looked into that at all, or is that a component of your studies? We have only kind of poked at that a little bit. There is a really terrific researcher um, who is in France, mm -hmm. Jean de Labar, who's doing a lot of work on this question. Okay. And so we're collaborating with him by sending him blood samples from our study so he uh, can see if this is a biomarker. Right. And this is another example of how collegial this Down syndrome research world is, that a lot of researchers are really interactive and collaborative, and we work together. And modern technology is really facilitating that. Oh. I don't think it could have been done otherwise. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Head. This has been, this has been great. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the audience or um, researchers, patients, that sort of? I think what I would like to convey is we have a really good opportunity to do prevention studies in people with Down syndrome, and they're far more challenging to do in the general population. So I would like to think that at some point in the future, in near future, is that people with Down syndrome will benefit a great deal from Alzheimer's disease research, especially with efforts uh, put forward like Bright Focus in training our new investigators and providing funding. So the more help we can get, the better and the faster we can get this accomplished. And um, again, it's the International Brain Bank for Down Syndrome Research. Uh, do you have a link that we can toss in the show notes? I think it's on the Bright Focus website link. Okay. We've worked together to put that put that up. So Excellent. Yeah, mm -hmm. that'll all be in the notes for everyone interested. Thanks again, Dr. Head. This My pleasure. Great. Thank you so much. That's going to be it here for us at the Straight From Scientist podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and especially if you've provided feedback or are our sponsor of the podcast. If you'd like to become a supporter, you can go to patreon.com forward slash SFS podcast. Another way you can support the podcast is through our collaboration with Plant Warrior. So Plant Warrior produces 100% all natural vegan protein, which contains all 21 essential amino acids, but does not contain any artificial sweeteners like sucralose that have been shown to do damage to your gut microbiome. They also plant one tree for every protein bag purchased. These guys have incredible values. They align perfectly with the Straight From a Scientist podcast, and we would not have them on as a sponsor otherwise. If you want to check them out, you can go to plantwarrior.co forward slash discount forward slash SFS10. Or you can just use the SFS10 discount on their website to get 10% off your order. Again, we really appreciate y'all listening. Hope you enjoy each and every episode.